So I'm excited for this moment for a lot of reasons. Um, as you heard from the stages, as Dan talked about the journey and progress of Think 3D, uh, truly believing that we can better the world by improving the way people live through improving how they work. And as we think about this, as we work with organizations, all shapes and sizes, it all comes down to this, and really say this very clearly. If you want to have a successful organization leading forward into the 21st century, there has, there's four pillars you have to have very intentional consideration of. Now we have this thing at Think 3D, nothing of significance happens without intention. So if you ask yourself, if I want to have significance in my relationships, if I want to have significance in the work that I do, and overall, if you want to say this life that you live was significant, it's going to come back to that word intention. And so as you think about this idea of, of intentionally investing into your world, these four areas, the first one being culture, Dan shared that a culture will emerge whether intended or not. But if it's not one you invest in, it's one that you pay for it. So as you look back at the workspaces that you found yourself in, maybe currently in the past, ask yourself how much intentional investment has been made to cultivate the culture. The second pillar that you have to have very intentional investment into is the personal dimension. Now this is one of the biggest gaps we see in today's day and age because when you think about personal development, from an organizational standpoint, most of that personal development was put on the responsibility of who? The individual. Read the books on your own time, do those type of things. And we asked this simple question. Is it an organization's responsibility to help make you a better person? Of course not, it's not their responsibility. But our argument to this is, is it to your benefit? And the answer is every single day of the week, the better that you are, you come back into this workspace better. You're a better teammate, you're a better boss, you're just better all around when you become that next better version of yourself. And this is one of the biggest gaps we see in our, in our society today. How much investment are we really making into ourselves? Data shows it, left to our own devices, literally, the average person is spending three and a half hours, social media, Netflix, all these different things. So you ask yourself, what are you doing with purpose and design to become the next better version of yourself. One of the other things that we have at Think 3D, a better you is better for everybody. And in a world, I grew up in Sioux Falls, and in a world of our Midwestern modesty, you don't see people talking about the things that they're doing, or aiming high, shooting for the moon, and they try to just do it in quiet. Well, here's, here's my challenge to that. Clearly, in my opinion, the best gift you can give the world, period, is the next best version of yourself. Because when you're not that next better version of yourself, you're a better parent, a better spouse. And what I see is not around in the world around me, I see people lacking in self-confidence and I see people in an abundance of insecurities. And that's founded in how much work do we really put in and pour into ourselves? Which leads me to the third pillar, the skill set. We deal mostly with organizations in this space about how do you help people develop the skills to become the next better version of themselves. A lot of it around communication because people do often what they do well. And when you think about effective communication, where do we learn in our lives to truly effectively communicate? Most of us don't. And the last one we don't like to talk a whole lot about, but it's very important, is accountability. We talk a lot about personal responsibility in this world, but most of the time when we talk about personal responsibility, we're aiming at somebody else. And kind of a theme of the conference a little bit, the, the book that I have wrote that's all on your tables is Elevate. Just heard from Dan talking about what they're doing at Principal Ron Elevate. And in my opinion, how do we start to elevate into that next best version of our lives? And so as we get into this, um, as we backtrack this, I want to open with this question. One year from today, September 26, 2024, you just had the best year of your life. Best year of your life. What is one thing that would have to be true personally and one thing that would have to be true professionally for that to be a true statement? Now, it's a powerful thought because, again, I'm simply saying two things. Two things. And as we're being honest, the video I played that we opened up, that was uh, our year-end team retreat at the end of 2021 going into 2022. And you should think about over the last almost two years, year and a half, 
How much of today, since that point, have you arrived with purpose, design, and intention? And so as you think about the future, what's the vision that you have for the life ahead of you? Now, I know I'm an optimist by nature, if you would, but I'm also a realist. And, and I love what Dan had shared about that 72, the 72 hours for most of us. Again, we have an addiction in our country of good enough. Good enough oftentimes because it's better than, right? It, it could be worse, which is one of the worst statements of all time because until you're dead, that's always a true statement. That can't be our bar. What is the bar we're really going after? What is that thing that we're really trying to aspire for? And that was the core of the book why I wrote this book called Elevate, is because when most people try to change the outcomes of their lives, they start simply with their actions and habits. And those have a lot of room in this space of how do we get to that next level. But there's two steps before the action steps that we take. Almost all of the actions that you take in life is predetermined by the emotional states you find yourself most, most often. So let's take, for instance, you want to get in shape. Tomorrow, I'm going to go to the gym. Tomorrow comes around, alarm clock goes off at 5 o'clock, and you hit that snooze button. You say, ah, I'll do it tomorrow. Why didn't you go to the gym? Because I didn't feel like it. Your feelings was the indicator of the action steps you did or didn't take. You did get up and go to the gym. Why did you go to the gym? Because I felt motivated enough. What's the precursor to the uh, emotions that you have? And it's the thoughts that you think. When you're pissed off, what are you thinking about? Whatever pissed you off. When you're happy, what are you thinking about? Sunshine, rainbows, and kittens, right? When you're sad, what are you thinking about? And so the core of this, if you want to really elevate your life, if you really want to get to the next level of outcomes in your life, you can trace it all the way back to the thoughts that you have every single day. The average person, let this sink in just for a second. The average person has about 60,000 thoughts a day. 60,000 thoughts. And most studies suggest around 90, 91% of your thoughts are about the same as they were yesterday. And so, if you think about the same as you did yesterday, what's the likely outcomes of your tomorrow? About the same. And so in this, I wanna invite you, you know, seven steps, seven things you can take into consider to take your life to that next level, to truly elevate into the next level of your life. And the first one starts with experiences. Now, I truly believe that a quality life, when you think about towards the end of your life, 80 years old, 90 years old, 120, whatever it is for you, when you look back over your life, and if you, for you to say, I had a quality life, it's gonna really come down to two things. The quality of your relationships and the quality of your experiences. But how many, of us in the room truly start to define what kind of experiences do you really want to have? Most suggested, suggested studies said that most individuals stop setting goals even. And to quote the motivational speaker Les Brown, he said, if you don't have goals in your life, you're basically a wandering generality. Now, that's kind of tough, but it's true. You're kind of like a leaf in the wind. The, the your temperature of your days and your months is going to be determined by your coworker's attitude that day to be determined by the events happening in life versus those who are very predetermined to say, what kind of life do I want to have? As we think about this, what experiences do you want to have? I have four categories up here for, you, for your consideration. This first one being relationships, right? I said again, the quality of life is going to come down to the quality of your experiences and the quality of your relationships. There's a book that came out over this last year called The Good Life. And this is the longest standing study on happiness that exists. Harvard has been studying out happiness over 80 plus years, generational happiness, all these different factors of happiness. And by a landslide, the number one indicator on your level of happiness in life comes down to your relationships. Now, part of our vision at Think3, our vision statement at Think3D, is to redefine the definition an expectation of workplace and community culture. Why it needs to be redefined? Because you think about far too long it's been this work-life balance, right? Where again, work is work and home is home. We believe in that idea of work-life integration because when you have a good or a bad day at home, does that carry over into work? Absolutely. When you have a good or bad day at work, does that carry over into home? Absolutely. But the thing that needs to be reconsidered when you think about the relationships, right now, if I ask all of you to write down the top 10 experiences of your life, 
the one through line that I guarantee exists in all of them is it had to do with other people. Right? Think about those moments, those highlights of your life. They give it the significance that it has based off of the people that you have to do it with. And given this baseline consideration that if 50 to 75% of your waking hours is spent going to work, thinking about work, complaining about work, all the different things about work, isn't it time we start to think about the person that you're next to for all of those hours who you literally see way more than your best friend? And oftentimes see more than your actual family. And so I'm not suggesting you have to be best friends with these individuals, but shouldn't you work on developing better relationships? Because the average adult, once you hit adulthood, every three to five years, you are gonna go through some major life event, both good and bad. Uh, deaths in the family, births of children, marriages, divorces, health problems, all the various things. You're gonna go through some major event every three to five years. So if that's a guarantee it's going to happen, Shouldn't you be cultivating these relationships for people that you're going to be next to for as many hours as we do? Because these are not just coworkers. These are people that you're doing life with. And so challenge yourself to ask yourself again, what kind of relationships do you want to have? Are you working to become that kind of friend or coworker to be on the other side of that healthy and quality relationship? The next experience I want you to challenge you to think about is the emotional side of it, right? In this, what kind of uh, factors do you want to have in terms of the emotions that you desire to have more often? Where do we get this wrong oftentimes? As you think about the emotional states when we dream about that next vacation. So show of hands, how many have a vacation on the books right now? Show of hands, right? For those who have a vacation, right, are you just getting benefit from that vacation when you go on, that, on vacation? No, you're getting anticipation right now. And then how many of you have ever been on vacation in this sunshine and rainbows the entire time? <laughs> no, there's traveling, airports, all the different things. What we're really getting at is the emotions that, we're, that we're, we're striving after. Happiness, joy, laughter. Now on vacation, that happens at a higher frequency. But those are the same emotions which we're intentional. We can create more of on a regular basis, which the more you elevate the experiences you have on an everyday basis, it adds to the quality of your life. What kind of outcomes do you want to have? Now in this outcome for me, we do a training called Success Mindset. And what's interesting when I do this training on Success Mindset is I ask folks, how many people have a personal or custom definition of what success means to them? Let me ask you that same question. How many of you in the room, show of hands, have a personal or custom definition of what success means to you? How many in the room? I see maybe a dozen or two at best. Here's the importance of that question. First off, if you don't have your own personal or custom definition of what success means to you, will you ever be successful? No. How can you? You cannot hit a destination that's not defined. And the importance of this is why it's so important that you take time to define what success is to you so that now the decisions that you're making both personally and professionally both contribute to your definition of success. Because in the absence of this, we often default to what the world says success is. And what does the world say success is? Money, power, fame, right? But yet, nobody in this audience is naive to think that by itself is success. You can turn on e-news tonight, TMZ, and you can see people with money, power, and fame, right? But if I offered you a billion dollars, but the caveat is you're going to be miserable, do you still want it? No, I know a lot of you are like, try me, <laughs> right? But again, there's a lot of very wealthy people who are miserable. Now there's two words, when I think about success, there's two words that come on the top, of, top rung for me. If I said, what is success to you when you think about individuals, describe their behaviors or characteristic traits, integrity, vision, hard work, determination, those type of things, right? But there's two words that really stand out the most to me when I think about success, and that is confidence and happiness. Number one, would you ever call somebody successful if they weren't confident? No. They don't be confident in everything, but they're confident in something. Now, how do you build confidence? Put the work in. How many of you in the room, show of hands, how many of you in the room are confident in the work that you do today? Show of hands. Good majority, right? Were you that, were you that way the, uh, day one? No. How'd you get there? You put the work in. You got the experience, right? Part of the reason why we see such a lack of self-confidence in so many individuals, if you ask them, how much work have you put in on yourself? Oh, man. Don't have a whole lot to show me. If tomorrow you woke up and said, I want to master playing the piano, 
and you spent 30 minutes a day over the next five years playing the piano, what's going to happen in terms of your confidence about playing the piano? It goes up. You cannot not do a thing over a long period of time and not get better and build confidence towards anything. So again, when you start to think about what do you want in your life, what are the things that you're going after, etc., you put the work in towards anything and it gains in confidence, which leads us into the second one, happiness. Would you ever in your life call somebody successful if they weren't happy? Not in my book, because happiness is the point. And so as we go along this journey, we start to think about how do we develop the experiences that gets us to this outcome of success? Let me give you the best definitions of success I've ever heard. Best definition of success I've ever heard is a worthy ideal pursued persistently with courage. Worthy ideal pursued persistently with courage. And this is why it's important to take time to define what kind of outcomes do you really want? If someone says, do you want to be successful? You should say, absolutely, but not by the definition of what the world says success is, but by my version of success, because that was makes, makes it all worth it, which then leads us in this last point, impact. Now, what's interesting about this, I've read various studies that say somewhere between, I've seen 70% upwards to 90%. 70 to 90% of people, by the time they hit retirement, so think about this for a second. You work 50 to 75% of your waking hours from 18 to retirement at 67. Over 40 some plus years of your life, you spend around work. And studies suggest over 70 to 90% of people hit retirement and still don't know what their purpose is. What's my purpose? It's part of the reason you see people hit 40s and 50s in this midlife crisis. What's it all worth? Let me give you a baseline of purpose. What if, at the end of your life, whatever that is for you, you can look back over your life and you can confidently say, I had a significant impact over just three people's lives. Just three. Is that in and by itself enough to say that your life had purpose? Absolutely. One person comes to this thing called life and impacts three people, you're a multiplier. So that's a baseline of purpose. Now, if you wanted to, could you have a significant impact on three people's lives over the next year? Absolutely. And so the baseline along this journey, again, you'll quickly find that part of the journey of part of the success and part of really finding happiness and impact has to do with our service to other people, right? And so asking yourself, again, when you can have that baseline of, of purpose and impact on other people's lives, that gives us the baseline of what we're going after in life. Now I think about this example, and I think about my grandparents. Love them dearly, but uh, I watched their lives that they worked so hard. They were farmers in, in uh, Marion, South Dakota. Woo, we had a Marion, South Dakota in our house, I like it. <laughs> and I look at, I don't think they've ever been on a plane. They sacrificed a lot. They kind of grew up coming out of the Great Depression era. But again, they never stopped and say, said, what kind of experiences do I want to have in these four categories? And so that's a baseline of elevating your life is asking truly, what kind of experiences do I want to have? I talk a lot about becoming the author of your life. Truly, you have a blank piece of paper in front of you. The challenge for most individuals is they're letting someone else write their script. Because go back to those 60,000 thoughts a day. If you go back to age 18, almost all of those thoughts that you had, all the habits, the behaviors, the belief systems you had, had almost nothing to do with you. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose the experiences you had for the most part. You didn't choose the neighborhood you lived in. But yet and still, that became the baseline of how you thought, how you saw the world as of age of 18. And though all of us have grown since that version, that became the baseline of who we were for the rest of our lives. And so how do you start to escape the past? You have to live it with intention. Which is the second one, living versus existing. Let me ask you, not to raise your hand on this one, but how many times a month at most, how many times a month do you truly and genuinely say to yourself, man, I love my life. And it's a crazy question, a very simple question, but it's crazy how very few people are genuinely living their best life. Think about it right now, out of the hundreds and maybe thousands of people that you know, how many could you name that are truly and genuinely living their best life? And ask yourself, why don't you see more people living their best life? It blows my mind in the country where we talk about our freedoms, we love our freedoms as we should, right? Because a lot of countries don't have these freedoms. We live in a country where you're free to choose 
your friends are. You're free to choose who you marry. You're free to choose where you work. And even the number one complaint among South Dakotans is what? Weather. <laughs> Guess what? We can choose to live somewhere else, right? But all these choices that we have, we absolve ourselves of the very choice, the freedom to choose the things that make us happy, the things that make us joyful, the things that truly makes us come alive versus just going to, into the existence of who we were. So really quick, I'm gonna have you jump into your tables just for three quick minutes. What I want you to do at your tables, I want you to share one thing that makes you come alive, something that time doesn't exist, here's in the state of bliss. What is one thing that when you're engaged in this activity makes you come alive, and how does that add value to your life? Three minutes at your table, share amongst your table mates, and go. All right, let's bring it back as a group in five, four, three, two, and one. So ask yourself this question. Of the things that you talked about, just a quick pause. Even notice the energy in the room just raised up a couple percentage points. And you weren't actually doing the thing that makes you come alive, unless that's the thing that makes you happy, is talking to strangers at your table. <laughs> but as we talk about owning our calendars, as I'll share in a minute, but you think about, what if, what if, out of your days and your weeks and the busyness of life, you identify things that truly make you come alive, and you made sure, you made sure that you were scheduling, prioritizing the things that make you come alive, because what do you do it for? I look at my mother, I love my mother, she made lots of sacrifices, but she's somebody where this quote really kind of came from, a seedling from me, that a life of regret is one that is filled with an abundance of unintentional living. So again, as you think about how you arrived here today, what percentage of your life would you truly and genuinely say you designed with purpose and intention and you arrived here by design? For most people, we can't say that. And we think about this, you look at the world around you, I think we all can be honest about this. Is more of society truly living or simply existing? Existing, you can look at your coworkers, when you drive, uh, drive home from work at traffic, you look around the cars, you want real evidence? Go to the grocery store at five o'clock and look people in the face. <laughs> That's not a whole lot of living in my opinion, right? And you think, one of the, one of the detriments to this is serotonin, dopamine. Our brains have never been designed to have this level of access to serotonin and dopamine. Let's look at our kids for the prime example of this, right? How many of you in the room, you're driving like five minutes from home and you hear your kids, can I bring the iPad? I'm bored, right? Bored wasn't even part of our vocabulary growing up. To make a point of this, right, again, I have a, a not my youngest daughter is nine, and I was coaching her basketball team this last year, that second and third grade girls, like Kurt and Kat, you guys know what I'm talking about? And we're literally in the middle of a basketball game. And my daughter's running the course. She's like, hey, Dad, can I have a sleepover tonight? <laughs> right now? We're talking about right now? What she was saying is, even in the midst of playing basketball sports, that was enough because her brain wanted to be lazy. It wanted to just swipe on something and watch and let the next thing entertain her. And this is what's against us because, back to what I said before, we have an addiction in this country of good enough. But you can look around you and most people are living the best version of a lesser life. More is always possible, always possible. But why aren't we consistently fighting for, striving for that next better version? And so if I ask you the simple question, do you want to have a phenomenal life? And most people would say, yeah, who wouldn't want to have a phenomenal life, okay. But what does a phenomenal day look like? Because a phenomenal life doesn't just happen, it's made up of a bunch of phenomenal days. Do you know how to have a phenomenal day on a Monday? Or are you one of those Eeyore people? It's Monday. <laughs> right? And then going back to the, st the standpoint of why work is so important, think about how work has us talking about most days of the week. Work on most Mondays, you hear, you hear a whole lot of Eeyore in the, in the room. Tuesday, okay, we're plugging away. Wednesday is what? Hump day, which is cold for halfway through surviving this thing called the work week. Thursday is the stepchild of the week, because we overlook it, because on Thursday it's almost Friday. 
And very unfortunately, but it's true, Friday now has become the number one day in this country where God gets the most thanks. Thank God it's Friday. And this goes back to, and then we rinse and repeat, maybe take a couple of vacations a year, do that for 40 years, and boom, you call that a life. That's not living, folks. That's not living with a purpose. I love when people say, how you doing, Tanya? Man, I'm living with intention. Because I designed this. Now is everything exactly the way I wanted? Of course not. But again, I have a very clear picture of what it looks like to live in my version, in my book, what matters to me. And so going back to the idea, what is success to you? I can tell you very clearly and confidently, success to me is progressively realizing that worthy ideal. So we get into this next phase, excellence. Starts with the decision. Now, how many of you, so here it is Tuesday, September 26th, how many of you woke up today and made the determining factor that I'm gonna be excellent today? Show me. A couple of you in the room. Let me ask those who did not. For those who did not choose to be excellent today, what's the chances that your day is gonna be excellent? Slim and none. And so going back to the idea of if you wanna have an excellent or phenomenal life, it starts with on an eight regular day, there's versions of how you can go through this day. I can go through it. A good attitude, poor attitude, good energy, bad energy, right? There's versions of how you go through every, could go through every single day. But it comes back down to a decision. Are you deciding to live with excellence? And I ask most people this, this, this idea of what are your standards? What are your standards when it comes to your relationships? What are your standards of expectations of your workspace? What are your standards of expectations in terms of living versus existing? And for most of us, again, we live as versions of who our parents were, the environments we come from, you've all heard this, you are the average sum total of the five closest people to you. When you really step back and start to reevaluate, you realize, man, my life is, it's kind of arrived here. And if I asked you, how many of you, and I'm sure you're but how many of you truly and genuinely are on a journey of self-mastery? Self-mastery. I love that, that Whitney talked about uh, Bruce Lee. I'm a huge Bruce Lee fan as well. And he was on this, this constant quest to master the next better version of himself. And in that, the mastery for me is about consistently going after this thing. If you're not on a journey of self-mastery, the reality is you're a slave to some degree to your past. Because again, the way you think, the way you feel, your habits of emotions and actions and behaviors, most of them derive from that version of yourself that you started off in life at age 18, in which you had very little say-so. So when you think about designing the ideal life, right, designing whatever you see for your future, who do you see as the hero of that journey? Do you even have a picture of that? What does it look like? And so when we think about these things, what's very revealing for most individuals, it's hard to even spend 20 minutes quiet in our own mind. Now, if you all you're given some free time, right? Let's say you're in you know, a restaurant and you're in the waiting room. What do you see everyone doing in the waiting room at a restaurant? On their phones, giving their attention somewhere else. Versus, if I ask you this question, how many minutes, not hours, minutes a day, do you spend imagining what that next better version of yourself and your life looks like? Minutes. And for most people, slim to none, right? But it starts, that's where this all starts. In my opinion, the real secret of success, if you want to be success, successful in your life, the real secret of success is found in self-discovery. You can chase success externally with money, the thing, the job. We all know it's temporary. It really starts with who am I? Why am I here? Purpose, identity, those type of things. So let's do this exercise really quick. Everyone, close your eyes for, for a quick second. And for the next two minutes, I just want you to imagine, this vision, what does excellence look like for yourself at work? What does excellence look like in your relationships? What does excellence look like in the next best version of your, of your movie? So I'm gonna challenge you 60 seconds, keep your eyes closed, and just imagine what excellence looks like in every area of your life. 60 seconds, silence with your eyes closed, envision it.
Okay, you're welcome back. Now, for a lot of us, if you haven't done that, simply, it is less than 60 seconds. Quiet. In your own mind, that was uncomfortable. And I trace this back. If you think about this mental pandemic that we're in, I really truly believe that a huge major factor why it accelerated so much over COVID is because we had to confront ourselves. You were left with just you in your home. And if we're really being honest, a lot of people in this room don't really like themselves. Primarily because you don't know this person, right? When you, you can escape into uh, work or escape into other things, activities, it's easy to build a busy life without really discovering who you really are. And in that, I want to challenge you guys to ask yourself, as you start to think about that, what excellence looks like, how can you start to develop plans of how you can step into excellence in all these spaces. Because we've all heard that saying, and it's not just cliche, there's real wisdom in that. How you do anything is how you do everything. Are you showing up with an excellent attitude, no matter what you're doing? Are you showing up for the people around you and being the best friend or spouse or parent that you can be? Are you showing up, showing up with excellence when it comes down to your disciplines and your habits, those different things? There's so many areas of our lives where we settled into good enough. It's fine. But if good enough, good enough shows up in those areas, odds are good enough is showing up in a lot of areas in our life. Now this next one to be, right? Culture con, vision, and version. What is the vision that you have for your life? And by most estimations, 95% of people's lives is really spent in the past or the history. You woke up today and you remembered who you were. And so you act about the same way, think about the same way, same type of behavior. When you really start to break it down, if you look at the five percenters of life, whether that's income, happiness, joy, the five percenters of life are the ones that spend a, a larger percent, a much larger percentage of the time focusing about who they want to become, what are they going after, what are their dreams and goals and aspirations, what are the visions they're chasing after. And so as I think about that, beyond the sarcasm of, how you doing? Living the dream, as Vadi always said, that's code for I want to end it. Are you really living the dream? Like how much of your life today did you really dream? Did you vision it? Did you see it before it happened? Identifying those type of things and asking yourself from that question, how much have you even allowed yourself to dream and vision? Now one of the things, again, I talk about this, that, that the best gift you can give the world is the best version of you or the next best version of you because be clear, there are people in your sphere right now by way of your actions and what you do in life, they need your permission by way of you showing them it's possible to strive and dream and believe. I didn't grow up in that type of environment. I grew up, uh, I see my parents struggle, I've been evicted many a times, right? I would say that kind of that borderline of lower middle class, upper lower class, kind of teetering back and forth. And in this world, my mom, literally when I started, my, I started my own business, my mom was pissed off at me, literally, because I had a six figure paying job, doing really well, it's like, this kid, just basically eat crap, <laughs> and you're getting paid well, just eat it, son. You're providing for your family, and she just couldn't see it. And we've all heard that statement. If you want to kill a big dream, share it with a small-minded person. And so it is important, again, who are the people in your sphere that you're sharing your dream with? I love this quote from Muhammad Ali. It says, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. In a world where literally, Anything is possible, right? In that video I shared opening up, talked about John F. Kennedy. The audacity to say by the end of this decade, we're gonna have a man on the moon before we even had a man in space. We had big dreamers, right? The people that really got us to where we're at in society, the ones that were willing to be obsessive and willing to have that big vision, that big dream. And the reality of this is that everything comes down to a thought. Right, think about this for a second. If everything in life comes down to a thought, it starts with a thought. Clothes that you're wearing, this, this uh, building, culture con, everything starts with a thought. Go back to Einstein, one of the greatest thinkers of our time. He said, imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attraction. So if you're not pausing in your day, and actually the science says about 12 minutes, if the golden number, if you can get to at least 12 minutes a day meditating, visioning, dreaming about your future, you start to train or uh, uh, change your brain chemistry. You start to look at truly becoming that next better version of yourself. But if you're not dreaming what a better future looks like, 
you're living as an extra in your own movie. When the vision of this is you can pick up the pen and you can write this out and you can be truly, when they say you can be anything you want to be within reason, right? That's a true statement. But how many of us are really going after that thing? Now this picture here, this was about a year and a half ago last summer, Bonnie and I were in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I had a vision of, I wanted to take my dad to the African American Museum and we were sitting on the steps and at this moment, Bonnie said, hey, we should, we should do this thing called Culture Code, a retreat space where people can get away, this compound, we've seen it in the work that we do, people just need to get away and refresh and rejuvenate. And I told my dad, who was with us, I had to take this picture of this moment because we're gonna bring that to fruition. Well, last Tuesday at Culture Con in Sioux Falls, we announced Culture Cove is gonna be an official thing come spring of next year. It started with a vision, an idea, a thought. Think 3D was birthed out of nothing, thin air. For an entire year, when I was still in corporate, I couldn't just jump out the window, right? Again, I had a good paying job. I was the breadwinner of my family. I told Bonnie, I said, show up at my house, nine o'clock every Monday night. Don't call me, don't text me. I want you knocking on my door. By the time I put my girls to bed, I'm free at that time. So from nine to midnight for almost an entire year, two men sat in my basement and ideated, dreamed, vision, trying to go into conference, trying to put this together. What could this look like? 2015, we wrote a book, came out in 2016, launched our business. And again, as we keep growing this vision, it keeps morphing, evolving. Now, one thing in this, I'm gonna invite you here in a second to ask you the simple question and have some conversation at your tables. What would it take for you to start to dream just one size bigger than you are today? Before you start talking about at your tables on this, I'm gonna share this with, with you about two and a half years ago. I saw a video from Steve Harvey. I'm gonna say on the roof, if you have a television, you know who Steve Harvey is. And he had said, develop a list of 300 things that you want. 300 things. Now again, most of us in our Midwestern modesty, oh, 300 things. You greedy SOB, how dare you? How dare you want 300 things? Well, Steve Harvey, you know his story, he was homeless. Living in his car, getting a for the first three years of his uh, comedy career, he was living out of his car, making about $5,000 a year. Not great money at all. So if he went from that to now being worth over $100 million, being on every television, right, all the different things, like, man, I'm gonna give this thing a try. He said, you're gonna struggle. Get to about 75, you'll struggle, because for most of us, we don't come from environments where you couldn't even <clears throat> dare to ask for anything, let alone, let alone 300. But I took him off on it. I said, let me develop my list. I don't call it once because once says it's a separation. I call it my 300 manifestations list. I love what uh, we shared earlier in the stage about manifestation, right? Again, when you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. So I developed this list. And he said, if you look at your list at least once or twice a day, you're going to find yourself hitting 20 to 30 things on your list every single year. Lo and behold, 2021, I did it about February of 21. Knocked off 22 things off my list that year. Last year, knocked off 25 things. My goal this year is to hit 30. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? When you start to have a dream and say, again, I have things on their experiences, I have a manifestations of relationships, obviously a lot of travel, the impact I want to have, and my, all these different things that I want. I get to want because I get to want it, right? One of my favorite Bible verses is, may he grant you the desires of your heart and make all your plans succeed. Well, you can't bring to fruition what you haven't made plans for. And so now as I'm confidently getting the things that are on my list because I dreamed it. I saw a vision of what my life would look like as I start to accomplish these things. Guess what happens to my confidence? Shoots up. Now I'm getting things that are on my list of things that I want. Guess what happens to my happiness? And let me ask you that simple question. Is there any area of your life that would not significantly benefit or improve the more confident or happy you were? Absolutely not. Every area of your life improves in that space. But it starts with daring to dream just one size bigger. So four quick minutes at your table. What would it take for you at this point in your life to just dare to dream one size bigger? Let's take three or four minutes at your table to talk about that real quick and go. All right, let's bring it back as a group in five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, here's two questions I wanna challenge you with as you think about that. What does it take to look one size bigger? My two favorite questions in the world are just two simple words. The first one is why not? Why not? The beauty of why not gets rid of all your excuses, right? You've all heard there's a million and one excuses in the world with no good reason. 
And in that space, why not? Why not go after your best life possible? Who benefits from that? Everybody. Which then the second question is, what if? What if you did? What if you stepped into a life that you got to design with purpose and intention? Now, does it happen overnight? Of course not. This version of myself today was very clearly and intentionally designed. I'm currently 44 years old, and I would really probably say about four or five years ago, I hit this tipping point of saying, yeah, truly, I am the author of my life. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, but again, when you start to think about what does a quality of life look like, quality of my relationships, quality of my experience. Now, we all know this, faith without works is dead. So how do, what's the action step you're taking then? Now, in this space, why B, right, the vision is the tipping point of the seven things. Now it's about taking action. What are those next few right action steps that you're going to take, that you're going to commit to taking in your life? For most people, part of the challenge in this is one of my favorite, other favorite quotes from, from Les Brown. He said, want shows up in conversation. Expectation shows up in behavior. You can sit around all day and want to talk about what you want, dreams, vacations, all those type of things. But truly look at someone's behaviors, and I'll tell you what they expect. Do you expect to be successful? Do you expect to be happy? What do you expect that's going to come back down to your behavior? And in that space for me, I found that the more I limit my options up front, so again, for me no longer, it's, it's, I don't give myself the option to hit the snooze button or the option to sleep in. I don't give myself a lot of these options. And I found that the more I limit my options by purpose and design, the more choices I have later in life. It's about the investment, right? Again, I got asked about a few months back, one of the gals who really is going through my all of our life coaching process, and she's like, does this ever get difficult? Like, do you ever truly get overwhelmed with doing all these type of things? And I said, really, it comes down to decide you're difficult. Because for me, yes, is it difficult developing discipline? Yes. Difficult being disciplined in how you eat, disciplined in your thinking, disciplined in your actions, your behaviors, your habits, that's difficult, yes. But when I look at people who are undisciplined, they have way more difficulties that I don't want in life. Difficulties in their relationships, difficulties in their health, difficulties at work. And so again, when you decide you're difficult, the less options you give yourself up front, the more choices you give yourself later on in life. And we have to be challenged in this space of, of a world of busy, right? We take about, talk about taking action, busy, 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 right? It's like, duh, you hear that often. But busy doing what? Are you truly making progress? Are you just filling your calendar with stuff? One thing that we unfortunately didn't get out of COVID that we should have is COVID showed us we don't have to be as busy as we have been. When the world slowed down, you couldn't do all the activities and couldn't do the things. And you had the time back. But when the world kind of came back to normal, if you would, quote unquote, we allowed those things back into our calendar. And so really it's about, are you designing your calendar with intention? Let me say this, this quote very, very clearly. If you don't learn to master your calendar, you will never maximize your potential. Now that's up to you as individuals. You get to choose, do you want to maximize your potential? Now I'm going to ask, why wouldn't you want to? Right? But that's your choice. We get to choose if you want to maximize your potential. If, if you say yes to that, it goes back down to what are you doing actively to master your calendar, to master your 168 hours that you have every single week? Are you putting things in there with purpose and design and intention? And so again, what action steps are you taking to move this thing called life forward? Which leads us into this next one, very important. Team, we all heard this statement. Rising tides lift all boats. How many of you, don't show your hands, but just how many of you ask yourself this question? How many on a regular basis go through a personal inventory of the people that you're around? And why this is important? Because they say you are the average sum total of the five closest people to you. Everyone vibrates at different levels. What is it like being around negative and complaining people? Where's their energy at? High or low? Low, right? We know it. What is it like to be around highly successful people or happy people? Where's their energy at? High. And so again, in this, know this very clearly. You can never enter into a room, whether it's this size, from five people, 10 people, and have a no effect because everyone in this room, you're vibrating at some level based off of your level of happiness, joy, complaining, anger, all the things that are going on, it has you at a vibratory level. And so when you're around other people who are in that same boat, right, wrong, or indifferent, you're gonna find yourself kind of getting averaged out by the people that you surround yourself with. And so when you think about this from a championship mindset, if you would, Think about a championship organization just for a moment. Let's take a football team since NFL is going on right now, right? Out of a championship team, there's three components that you have to have in order to be a championship organization. Number one, quality coaching. 
Who are the people that you're allowing in to coach you in your life, whether that's an actual coach, whether that's mentors? Who are the people that you're learning from? Because the benefit of a coach is that they have either more experience than you or see things that you don't in your life. How many people do you, trusted advisors, do you allow in on a regular basis to coach and pour into you? Even for me, I grew up, I never had a mentor, an actual mentor. My mentors were books. John C. Maxwell was one of my greatest professional mentors. I read over 40 of some of his books. So I was very intentional about the people that allowed to pour into me. The second component is your teammates, right? Who are the people that you're locking arms with? Who are the people that you're dreaming with? Who are the people that are truly striving to be the best versions that they absolutely can? Whether you're talking personal or professional, let's take it back to the workplace just for a moment. If you're not around people who truly want to be the best version that you can in, in whatever organization you're at, right, you need to have different individuals around you because in this space of 50 to 75% of your waking hours is spent around work, you will not live the best life possible independent of an ideal workplace culture. Now, I say ideal is not about there, it's not about perfect, it's are you making progress? Do you have evidence to say your organization culture is better today than it was six months or 12 months ago? And so as you think about the people that you're locking arms with, who are those key people? One of the, one of the think 3 way tenets that we have is be somebody that you want to go through life with. Because these are not just coworkers, these are people I'm actually doing life with. When I'm going through difficulties in life, I need to have those people that have my back, that I can build that trust with. So how are you developing the mindset of those individuals that truly want to build that championship organization? And the last one is, how do you develop those new individuals coming into your workspace? We call it rookies or transfers, right? So when people come to work in your organization, what is their experience like those first 30 days, first 60 days? Is it the same thing that was sold to them in the interview? How are you developing this out to truly build a championship level team? And I don't have it uh, for sake of time, I can't do it right now, but I would challenge you to do that as a takeaway. What are some of the things that you're actively doing to develop and enhance the sphere of people that you're around on a regular basis. Now, can you change everybody? No. But what is the best position to put yourself in to change at least some people around you? Investment into yourself. It's one of my mantras. You teach through the clarity of your example. If someone were to follow you around for an entire week from just five to 10 feet away, how would they describe you? How would they describe your attitude? How would this describe your outlook on life? How would it describe when challenges come your way? Because it's through your example that you have influence on other people. That's the best definition of, of, of leadership I've ever heard. It comes from John Maxwell. Leadership is influence. And that comes both good and bad, right? Be clear, Hitler was a leader. Not a good one, right? Are you leading effectively through the clarity of your example? Which leads us back into this last piece. Enrichment. This is what this is really about, right? The definition of enrichment is the action of improving or enhancing the quality or value of something. To the best of our knowledge, we only get one thing called life, this one version of this vision we have through this entire life. Don't we want to enrich it, improve it, enhance it, the quality of this thing called life? And that really comes down to these individuals. Actually, this photo was taken just a few months ago um, out uh, close by um, Fairview. And this is a group of individuals that I had for an elite mindset retreat. It's about the people that you're going through life with. I was on my first, uh, three years ago in December, I went on my first thinkcations. So Bonnie and I were supposed to take a, uh, a year-end business trip to Mexico. And in the last minute, he couldn't go, so I went with myself. And spent three full days there by myself, having a lot of good thoughts, a lot of good depth discovery. And I heard this, this beautiful saying or quote from the uh, Vietnamese uh, Buddhist monk, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. He said, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. On this thing called life, this journey we're on, how are you putting enrichment into every single day? Now, real quick, in, the, in your notebook or something in front of you, I want you to write down the three most precious things to you in your life. Take 30 seconds real quick. Write down somewhere on your notebook or your journal the three most precious things to you in your life. I'll give you 30 seconds to think about what it is and write that down. Three most precious things to you in your life. 
Now, as you write those down, quick show of hands, how many of you in the room put yourself amongst the most precious things in your life? Handful of soap. Here's what I want to leave you with this challenge. We take care of things that we value and that we view as precious. Let's say I'm a, I'm a car collector and I have a 64 Mustang, right? And um, I value this car and it's precious to me. I'm going to spend time making sure it's in pristine condi condition. I'm going to make sure I take care of it in a different way. And oftentimes, see, this is where we have this issue or uh, opportunity in our society is we give and you give and you give. When you think about all the roles and responsibilities that you in the room wear, spouse, parent, community member, the multiple roles you probably wear at your jobs and your workspaces, where do you often find yourself on that totem pole of importance? Excuse me, towards the Bible. And again, this thing, that we talked a lot, of, a lot of folks on the stage said that today, about kind of they were, up, they were, they were raised up to not be a bright color, raised up to kind of tuck theirs in and just let their accents speak. My challenge in that is, as I look around in society, one of the core gaps or issues we have is people lacking self-confidence, filled with insecurities. Never in my life have I seen a fully confident and secure person tearing somebody else down. I know in a lot of our communities, I can speak to the African-American community, right? Again, the crabs in a barrel mentality, right? You want to tear them down when they're, oh, you're, you're getting too big for your bridges. Think about that statement when someone says, oh, you probably heard this. Oh, they're, they're so full of themselves. You're so full of yourself. Have you ever paused to ask yourself, what's the alternative? Are you supposed to walk around less than yourself? And it's from that gap. When you walk around, when we look around society, people are walking as, as, as lesser versions of themselves. That's where you leave space for the toxicity around you. Are you exposed to more negativity or positivity in this world? Negativity. Right? And so when you leave space for that, that's where it spills into your personality. It spills into, it becomes easy to complain because everyone's doing it. But think about that person that's always positive all the time. Oh, there goes James, always so happy. What's the alternative, ladies and gentlemen? Well, my argument is very this. The best you is better for everyone, period. So what are we actively doing in that space to become that next better version? Confidently. And here's the thing about, I use this word a lot, arrogance. We're talking about arrogance, right? They often mistake confidence for arrogance. Well, arrogance is, is two things. Thinking you're better than somebody else and, and or thinking you know more than somebody else. And so first of all, someone that says, you think you're better than me, how big is your ego that you think that you know what I think? <laughs> right? In that space, and I'll be very clear. Tell the world, yeah, I am better than somebody. This one person, though. The old version of me. And when you have clear and present evidence that you're working on you, that becomes permission for other people to step into the best version of themselves. All of you who have ridden in an airplane before, uh, the stewardess comes on and says this announcement. In the unlikely event that turbulence happens, the oxygen mask drop, what are you supposed to do? Put your mask on first. Why? <clears throat> Can't help anybody else when you're passed out, right? How many people are truly walking through life, going through the motion, passed out? When the life, the life announcement should be this, in the absolute likely event that turbulence is going to happen, what should you have on your face? Your oxygen mask, knowing clearly and, present, uh, clearly and presently what it takes to become that next better version of yourself. And I'll leave you with this. Again, a quality of life, when it comes down to it, it's going to start with the quality of your experiences and the quality of your relationship. But all that comes back down to the square one of how are you elevating the way that you think. And so as you leave here today, and you're going to hear Bonnie challenge you some more here in a second, think about it. The core of this, the foundational part of this is how can I start to elevate the way I think? How can I elevate the way I dream? How can I elevate and expand the vision for my life. And how do you get there? You get there to the different versions with purpose and intention. Thank you, guys.